Good morning. Good morning. You're a good looking bunch this morning. There's only one group better looking than you. It was the 24 children that were up front this morning. Can you say amen? amen? Now, I only need your help, parents, with one thing. Bring them back next week. It's a great season of year. We've, uh, we've turned our hearts towards Thanksgiving time, a time to be thankful, a time to give, and now we're looking forward to the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is an incredible time of year. Can you say amen? amen. I, we're going to go to the Word here in just about 60 seconds to 120 seconds. I just have to tell you a couple of things that I'm thankful for. I can't see you as well as you can see me. Most of you have missed my wife. I think she's here today. Is she here? She was here last week, but she wasn't feeling well enough to be here for church. She's been gone for about two months, caring for a 90-year-old 90, 90 aunt in Denver, and I've gone back a couple of times. So I'm especially thankful that she has returned home. And uh, there's just a good thing about that. Um, I'm thankful for our church family and the way that you relate to each other. That when one has a burden, you can share that burden. Sometimes uh, when we're carrying burdens, uh, sometimes we just need that love and skin and that word of encouragement. You know how that works? You already sensed it and experienced, I know. Um, so, Thanksgiving leads to a time when we give thanks and we give, and it leads to a time of hope in Christ's soon return. Seventh-day Adventists are a people that have hope in the soon second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that hope is not just a future hope, it's a hope that looks back. And we're going to explore that three-dimensional aspect of hope. The hope of the first advent, the hope of the second advent. We're going to do that in just a, a couple of minutes. I brought a, just a couple of things that might serve as a little bit of object lesson, if you please, this morning. You may recognize them. Let's see, what else do we have in here? Oh yeah, a couple more things. You may have seen one of these on your Thanksgiving table somewhere. How does this tie in with hope? You hope it's good. <laughs> oh, it does look good. It's good, very good. It's an amazing thing that God, God provides us with food to eat. The fruit wouldn't last long unless it had a future in its heart. You and the, you know, the folks that are sitting in the bleachers, turn your uh, telephoto eye lenses on, and you can actually see there's an apple here. And you can see right 
in the center of the apple is the future, the seed that is going to be the next generation of fruit. The scripture talks about the seed, Jesus' seed, and his heritage. Thanksgiving time, every time you eat, every time you see that seed, remember that it is the next generation that is the hope of the church. We are here for a reason, and it's to share our faith and hope with our children. Start at a very early age, a very tender age, sharing the hope that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, hope, hope sometimes wanes in life, and sometimes we come into difficulties in life, and sometimes the difficulties transform us. A little something that may, you may have had after Thanksgiving. Anybody like this? Popcorn? Buttered popcorn? Mmm, that smells good. Popcorn doesn't start out like this, does it? No, it doesn't start out like that. It starts out something like this, doesn't it? And that is how our lives are sometimes. We start out just as ordinary corn until trials, fiery trials come in. And all of a sudden, we don't like the trials, but something pops in our life. The pressures, the Holy Spirit works, and we come through the pressures, and we come through it with hope, and we're transformed into new people in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the seed. So we have the transformation. Well, what's Thanksgiving without a little something sweet? Now, your sweetness might be something other than pumpkin pie. I have a, you know, a special affinity to it myself. So if you like pecan pie, I'll swap you. You like apple pie, it's okay. You like ice cream better, even better yet. I have this theory when it comes to ice cream. There's a raging debate, quality versus quantity. I go with quantity. <laughs> How about you? When it comes to pumpkin pie, I go with quantity. But there's something real sweet about Thanksgiving and the pumpkin pie. Because when you're all finished with it, and you're full, and you can't eat any more, you say, thank you, Lord, for the wonderful, bountiful blessings we have partaken of. Because as you eat that last, second, or third piece of dessert, you're thinking of leftovers for tomorrow, right? You're thinking of Friday, how soon will Thanksgiving be coming again? Yes? You hear me? Now let me be very clear, this is just a little symbol of what is to come. Because hope of the past, our present day hope, doesn't, isn't completed here, but it's the hope of being with Jesus and gathering around that banquet eating table in, Jer in the New Jerusalem. What do you say? Amen? Amen? All right, now you just can't wait to get home. I can see it in your eyes. Our message today is entitled Hope. I struggled with the message to some degree as I read and prepared this week. For sometimes we are filled with hope. And other times, hope is languishing in our lives. The times that our lives are filled with hope are times of creativity, are times of growth. Martin Luther King said, if you lose hope, somehow you lose the vitality that keeps life moving. 
You lose that courage to be that quality that helps you go on in spite of it all. And he said, and so today, I have a dream. I would add, I have a hope. So how is it in your life? Where do you find your hope that sustains you? Where do you find your hope that gives you a place to center your life. And what happens when the storms of life come in your life? Where are your anchor points in your life? What does the scripture have to say when your hope has been removed and the dark clouds of hopelessness crowd the soul? When all of the light of day is gone, and there's a nighttime and darkness of soul in your life for the hours, days, or weeks. What have you got to say to a world that is searching? What have you got to say to a world that is indifferent? What have you got to, uh, uh, to say to your neighbor when they look at you and they say, Can you tell me about that radiance that you have in your life? What's it all about? What have you got to say on those off days when you just as soon stay closed up and not be around anyone? Ever have one of those? I do from time to time. I give myself a time out. I lock the door and say, get a better attitude before you talk with somebody, before you disappoint yourself in your interaction. It's part of the human experience, isn't it? So, where do you find your hope today? Many, t many today find their hope in what they have achieved, what they're able to accumulate, what their success from an outward standpoint looks like to others, someplace their hope in their own strength that somehow they will be able to navigate life. Somehow some people place their security and hope in the size of their 401k and their cash holdings in their bank only to realize that that is on shaky ground. Some people face, uh, place their hope in their abilities to perform the religious deeds that they understand that they need to perform. And they place their hope in their ability to somehow reach a perfection that their lives will be satisfying to Christ. And at some point, they come to the understanding that they're not strong enough to face the cares of life. They're not secure enough when poor investments take that which they thought would be enough. They get the pink slip and they don't know how they're going to pay the mortgage. They realize that their own self-righteousness is not enough to allow them to stand before the throne of grace. Hope. Where do we find it? Hope. How do we build it? What does the scripture say about it? Our anchor text is found in Psalm verse 39, verses 6 through 8. There's a question there that the psalmist asks in Psalm 39, verses 6 through 8. Surely everyone goes around like a mere fathom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. So the question today, the question that the psalmist asks is in verse 7. But now, Lord, what do I look for? So I ask you today, what is it you are looking for? What is it you are hoping for? What is it you are longing for? For we look for 
we hope for, and we long for so many different things at so many different times in our life. We go in search of those things that are just beyond our reach at times, as, as if to suggest if somehow we can only grasp that which we don't have, it will be enough. If somehow we can only find the peace that is just out there a little ways, it will suffice the yearnings and longings of our soul. What is it we are looking for? Or to put it another way, what is it we are hoping for? So today, for just a few minutes, let it resonate in your consciousness through this day. Let it be found to be lingering in your heart today in this week. To ask the question, what is it you are hoping for? Because it's a question that somehow causes us to wrestle with. What is it that God wants me to be hoping for today? And that's a different question at times than the question that comes forward, what is it I am hoping for? For you see, challenges come into our life. You face people all around you who at times have very little hope. You can tell it when you look into their eyes. You can tell it by their conversation. When you sit, uh, when you sit on the Metrolink next to them and they talk about the weather and they talk about face, I want to be careful here. When they talk about the latest tweet, the latest trouble in the world, but they don't talk much about things that will transform their lives. And we enter into that chatter. You know, there's deep things. There's surface things. And there's chatter. There's chatter of everyday chatter. And they're looking and they're longing for somebody who will reach through that everyday talk and engage them in the hope that is the quiet desire of their soul. So I ask you today, what is it you are hoping for? So let's go to God's Word this morning for a few minutes and look and see what God's Word talks about where we can find hope. Because there's a reasonableness to the hope that we have as Seventh-day Adventists. There's a word that I use, a reasonable hope. The reasonable hope works something like this. I hope, I hope that tomorrow, by way of comparison and contrast, there's an unreasonable hope that sometimes lingers in the back of people's minds. An unreasonable hope would be something like this. I hope tomorrow that somebody would drop on my doorstep a check for a million dollars, which would be actually good. Now, would that be a, a reasonable hope or an unreasonable hope? Probably somewhat unreasonable. I hope that God will, will just, just give me everything I like, not everything that he thinks is good for me so I can be happy. Reasonable or unreasonable? That's unreasonable. Is there a reasonableness to a Christian's faith? Is there a reasonable hope that we can share with others? What reason can we give them other than our opinion that God is good? Let's go to the Bible and let's see how we shape and frame the hope that we have to offer to the world today. The psalmist says, My soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I put my hope in your word. If we have anything to offer to the world, it is based on the Scripture because it comes with the full authority of the Scripture. Psalm 119, we're going, I'm going to give you the reference, jot them down. 
Psalm 119 verse 114 says, You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. No place else in the world where we put our, our hope. We put our hope in the Word of God because it is by the authority of the Word of God that we can share the hope that we have with brothers and sisters in Christ and with others. The psalmist says in Psalm 119 again, verse 147, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I have put my hope in your Word. It is in the living word of our Lord, it is in the living word of scriptures where we find our hope. And we must turn those who are coming asking, where is it you find hope? Is it in the latest philosophy? Is it in the latest new trend? It is in the scripture, friends. Take them to the word if you want to, if you want to anchor them where they will find hope for their souls and steadfast hope that will allow them to endure the difficulties of life and the, and the problems that they will face. A living hope for sure built upon the word of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, uh, Praise be to the Lord and Father of God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. And in verse 13, He says, Therefore, with minds that are alert, and are fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Our hope, our hope is founded on the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is three-dimensional hope in time. For you see the forefathers before Christ look forward to his birth in Jerusalem. That is a hope of factual Peace built on the, prophet, the messianic prophecies that have been fulfilled. It works something like this. Suppose I could tell you today of somebody who would be born 700 years from now. I would tell you in what city they would be born. I would tell you his or her name. And in 700 years from now, that prophecy came true. You would, get, you would put some credibility in my prophetic gift, right? You would. Now bear in mind that Christ came at the exact time, the exact place, just as the prophets of long ago predicted. Credible hope. Credible hope that looks back and says, this hope is not just built on speculation. This hope is built on the fact that Jesus Christ fulfilled those prophecies. But that hope was not just for the days that he lived in. That hope has a three-dimensional three timeline to it. Past and completed prophecies. Present during the hope in life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And a future hope. And we're living just before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe we are living in the very last segment of time. Do you believe that, friends? I can guarantee you that for two very, uh, very salient reasons. If you are fortunate to live to be 90, that's a good lifespan. If you're fortunate to live to be 105, that may be a good lifespan. If you hit 120, that would be an exceptional lifespan. But what I can tell you regardless of the length of your life, whether it's another 50 years, 60 years, 40 years, 10 years, 5 years, or shorter. If you are laid to rest, the next thing you will know will be the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is close, friends. It is close. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has said it's been close for 150 plus years. 150 years in light of eternity is less than a, a blink of the eye. Right around the corner. This hope is not something that is somewhere in the future that is a long ways off. 
It is eminent right at the door. So how is it, friends, in your life? What are you building your hope upon? Romans chapter 15. is an interesting chapter. I struggled this, this week a little bit in talking about hope. Because as a pastor, sometimes we walk into situations that are very difficult. Strained relationships, a pronouncement of illness that looks incurable, personal struggles where people say, I don't know if I can go on. And I struggle for a bit, and I say, while well, hope, while well, hope, I have hope in my heart, how is it I can communicate that in a way that will touch people's lives who are going through crisis? Jot down Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, Paul writes there of the ministry of hope. He says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it was written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything which was written in the past was written to teach us that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. First and foremost, we might have hope. But secondarily, if you continue in Romans chapter 15, here's the good news. We have hope. We have hope. The good news, though, is found in verse 13, for it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you like that? Did you catch it? I read that and I said, Lord, thank you. And here's why. It's not in my human capabilities to somehow infuse you with hope. That's a holy work of God. I can tell you about my experience. I can share with you that Christ has bore your burdens. I can share with you that there's hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I can share with you that the Scripture says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I can share all of that with you and cognitively share that information. And you can understand that. But there's only one agency in the universe that can infuse hope in your heart. And that's done by the Holy Spirit. Hope is brought forth into your heart in life by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it's brought forth into the heart and lives of others as you share the hope that you have. That in their hearts will burn the flame of the hope of the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it makes all the difference in the world. For you see, looking forward, we don't go forward as a people without hope. We go forward as a people with difficulties. We go forward as a people that are filled with anxiety. We go forward as a people that face the struggles and endure the trials of life. But we go forward not in our own hope. We go forward in the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? amen. We have a hope to share, friends. And it's not the hope of human devising. It's the hope from the throne of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just a few more, and then we're closing. Psalm 119 again. Verse 114, jot it down, mark it in your Bible. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. 
not in a philosophy. I want to be careful here. Not in somebody's good advice, but in the Word of God. 147 says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I put my hope in your Word. You like that? I rise before dawn. Now, for some of you, that's really tough. For other views that have uh, <clears throat> approached early middle age, you find yourself waking up before sunrise, hoping to go back to sleep. Before dawn, putting our, our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ until the day is over when we give him thanks. Peter says, a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead, that we would be ready when Jesus comes. Titus says, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. Hebrew says that ultimately, we find our hope, not in speculation, but we find our hope, a hope that anchors the soul in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, we have this hope as a what? As a what? As an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, it enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Some of you may be boaters. Some of you may be sailors. If you're ever on a high sea or on a lake when the winds come up, you drop that anchor that the ship might just be there, not tossed everywhere. And when you have Christ in your life, you have an anchor that anchors your soul steadfast and sure. And with that anchor, you have a hope, our Lord Jesus Christ, that regardless of what comes in the quietness, in the quietness of night, when the soul is troubled, He's right there to hear your prayers. He's right there to move you from a position of just a little hope to say, in just a short while, you'll be with me. In just a short while, the troubles that you're facing will fade away. In just a short while, as you, call, as you cast your cares upon me, peace will come to your soul and life will get figured out. So we come back to the question, but now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope, the psalmist says in Psalm 39, verse 7, my hope is in you. And may this season, as we look, towards celebrating Christ's birth. Be a season filled with hope and anticipation that looks back with the reasonableness of hope. And we come to the Lord and worship Him that the Spirit fills our life, that our hope is anchored and secure in our Lord Jesus Christ our righteousness. May the Lord bless us as we seek Him to anchor our lives in. Our closing hymn now is hymn number 633, When We All Get to Heaven, 633.